Good afternoon, everyone. This is the, thank you, that helps. I need a, I need a big gavel or uh, some kind of a bullhorn or something. Can everybody hear me? Okay. My name is Michelle Socolo. I'm the Community Development Director for the Town of Hudson. And by night, I'm a selectman for the Town of Lexington. I'm also the President of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. So it's my privilege to be the moderator of this afternoon's session on parking minimums and maximums. Maybe we could close the doors out there. <laughs> okay. If somebody could do that, that would help. Okay. I think this afternoon's topic is going to be very interesting and I commend you all for staying throughout the whole session. Today's turnout has been terrific and very exciting and I think it's a real testimony to the fact that we're all struggling in our various different communities to figure out how to regulate parking, how to promote parking, how to preserve parking, how to build just the right amount and not more than the right amount. And I'm fascinated by today's topic, minimums and maximums, because in Hudson we're struggling with uh, looking at revitalizing our downtown and changing our zoning. And we actually have one of the very few downtowns that has no parking requirements at all. But we have merchants suddenly in recent years saying, we need more parking, and they're looking to the community to build that parking or figure out an answer to the parking problem. So as we look at our zoning and uh, what we should do, I'm hoping to learn from these wonderful panelists who have uh, far more knowledge on the subject than I do. So we have three people here with us today. Patrick Reffitt from the town of Natick. He is the community development director. He's held that position for about eight years and previously w worked for the, uh, the city of Salem, uh, was the planning development director in Newburyport, and also um, was the state supervisor of alternative transportations for the e Executive Office of Transportation and Construction. He received his degree uh, in landscape architecture degree from the University of Kentucky and his master's from Texas A&M. So we're going to start with you and we're going to go work from my, from my right to my left and we'll do questions and answers at the end of the session. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, again, my name is Patrick Reffitt. I'm Speaking Community Development Director in the town of Natick. And um, Having worked in this field for effectively 30 years, I can tell you that... Put the mic closer to your mouth. I can tell you that uh, the part of planning that is the most masochistic has to do with parking. The other part has to do with rezoning. Um, let me set the stage a little bit for you regarding the community that I... I'm working in, um, we have uh, a very compact downtown. Uh, it's probably about a quarter of a million square feet of commercial space. Um, it happens to be, luckily, in very historic buildings. Uh, these structures were largely con constructed during an era before automobiles were even a concept. So, as you would well imagine, the properties that those structures rest upon really aren't big enough to accommodate parking of any amount whatsoever. Um, so, those structures are, are generally occupied with retail and services on the bottom level. Uh, many of them effectively are vacant above. Um, we do have uh, about four parking lots that are municipally owned, operated, and maintained in downtown. Uh, we do have parking programs uh, for the business community, uh, individual employees, town employees. We also have commuter parking as well within those four lots. Um, town employees as well as uh, functions that are entertained by the town, the library, uh, police and fire, uh, tend to occupy a lot of parking within the community as well. We have, um, we've wrestled for a long time with how do we make our downtown a more vibrant downtown that people want to come to, they want to patronize, they want to be part of. and 
as part of that discussion, we really recognize that the three R's are the things that will make our downtown more effective and vibrant. Retail, restaurants, and residential. And we've been working toward each of those. Um, recognizing that we have such a deficit relative to parking, um, we've decided that for the retail spaces in downtown, we're eliminating any parking requirement whatsoever except for employee parking. So long as you, Mr. Developer or occupier of a property, can meet your employee parking needs, the rest of it is free. Um, we instituted that about four years ago. We've seen absolutely no ill effect having made that change in that amount of time. Uh, if anything, I think downtown's probably more vibrant now than it was four years ago. Um, we have also uh, allowed parking for business and restaurants and other employees to take place during the permitting phase off-site, which heretofore, all of the zoning requirements expected the parking to be on-site. So. If an employer, developer, et cetera, wants to have uh, or occupy a space, if they have the ability to obtain space off-site, they can do so. Uh, we have uh, had some success in that to date uh, with uh, residential developers having procured property a couple of blocks away uh, that we're now seeing take place. Uh, another program that we instituted that has yet to be um, subscribed to within uh, any development project uh, that we instituted was a buy-down uh, program, which allows a developer, if you're occupying a space, uh, to be able to buy down some of your parking requirements as part of future town financed capitalization uh, projects for parking, whether it's buying the land, constructing a parking garage, uh, or any such uh, acquisition of that sort. Uh, so those are the, some of the uh, legislative changes that we've made. Uh, we really hope to see them being more subscribed to in the next decade now that we're pulling ourselves out of a fairly weak economy over the last several years but um, we are also constantly seemingly undertaking parking studies uh, as soon as we finish one we start another uh, well, very often the conclusions are very similar, but I can tell you very often having a different mindset uh, also brings a different set of, of approaches, and we emphatically believe that reducing the parking requirements from the typical one space being required for 350 square foot of office space is categorically something that will help our downtown move ahead. Um, one of the, the items that I, I particularly want to pursue as part of our downtown parking efforts is a recognition that there are a lot of privately constructed, maintained spaces that are never used. I am uh, going to be working with uh, staff to <laughs> develop a program that has private owners of available spaces to be able to lease through an arrangement um, you know, legal, basically as a, a tenant at will, uh, to lease those kinds of spaces to other users that may need those kinds of spaces. So um, we're going to be undertaking a lot of different uh, fixes, if you will, but again, uh, parking's one of those things that continually require a, a reevaluation and a determination as to whether they're working or they're not. Uh, 
um, and having the ability to come to sessions like today is uh, very helpful to me and um, I will note that probably a tenth of the people in the crowd are from Natick today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vineet Gupta, who is the Director of Planning at the Boston Transportation Department. Under his leadership, Boston has established its Complete Streets Initiative, which if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check it out on their website. It's an impressive document. Uh, they introduced pollution-reducing parking policies and published Access Boston. His work is driven by a robust public process involving advocates, neighborhood groups, and public agencies. He has a master's, a dual master's degree in architectural studies and city planning from MIT. Vinny, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm extremely happy to be here to talk about Boston. Uh, we spent most of the morning looking at progressive policies, policies of the kind that uh, Boston has been pursuing to some extent. My presentation is, is, is going to talk about those policies, but our policies are also driven by what we hear in the neighborhoods, week after week, month after month. So it's, it's really kind of the realities of uh, what we can do and the kind of ambitions of what a progressive park, uh, parking policy might let us do. So uh, my presentation is uh, uh, three parts, a very quick uh, policy framework. The meat of the presentation is going to be on, the, on kind of the instruments that are available to Boston to implement that policy and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, new programs that we've started to explore. When we think about uh, users, uh, residents, customers, or employees, uh, there are three dimensions that our policy is informed by. Uh, we think about uh, convenience. Uh, is parking available when they want it? Uh, where they want it for these users. Uh, climate, are we doing enough to reduce the supply of parking in the city uh, to address the exigencies of, uh, of climate change? And finally, cost, and this has to do with affordability as well as kind of uh, finding the right cost between on and off street parking. If there's one, uh, if there's one place that you can look to uh, where all of this comes together, it's in the back bay. Uh, if you've just moved in, you can, uh, uh, you can spend a fortune and get a parking space uh, all to yourself all the time, uh, off street. Uh, or you can get a residence sticker and park for free on Marlboro Street or one of the residential streets. Uh, if you're uh, coming to shop on Boylston or Newbury Streets, you can, uh, you can just go to a parking garage. The Boston Common Garage is $1.14 uh, uh, for two hours. Or you can keep circulating around till you find uh, to just spend the dollar and a quarter for on-street parking. While this is useful, I would argue that this is, uh, you know, this is a highly defined uh, and well-developed mixed-use area. Uh, I would argue that we need to look further. We need to look, and we have been doing that, we have to look beyond the back bay, and we have to look further into the neighborhoods of the rest of the city. And we have to think about what happens in East Boston, what happens in Jamaica Plain, or what happens in Roxbury. And so most of what I'm going to talk about is actually about those neighborhoods and less so about what happens in the back bay. Not that back bay is not important. So a quick, uh, go through uh, on the convenience side, really our biggest priority, uh, you know, a goal of the city is to uh, make sure that the mobility needs of our residents are looked after. Uh, do they have parking where they need it, if, either if they're taking their kids to school, going for a job, uh, or just simply parking at home? Uh, but convenience is more than just having parking spaces. Convenience is also having choices on how you can travel. Are you able to find parking for a zip car in your neighborhood? Is there enough parking for a bike share station? Uh, if you're in an office building, is there the convenience of a van pool parking spot in your, uh, in your building? 
So uh, all of those things uh, are, are on the convenience scale. And really, do you have the information that you need in real time to find that parking space? I think that's important as well, because you, uh, you could search around for parking space for a very long time. On the climate front, uh, it's really about uh, reducing parking supply. And our policies, as you'll see in a minute, uh, have really focused on that in a big way. And it's encouraging less ownership of autos, while, of course, uh, continuing to make progress on providing public transport access as well as access to other modes of travel, uh, particularly bicycling. Uh, but climate also has to do with providing enough space for clean fuel vehicles and for uh, looking at alternative uses for parking spaces uh, as, we, uh, as we develop our, our regulations and policies. And finally, uh, there's the issue of cost. And uh, this has to do, on the one hand, with affordability, uh, but also with finding uh, the right price. And uh, this is more in the neighborhoods, but when you look at uh, cost relative to uh, downtown parking, we want to make sure that uh, our policies uh, are at the very least uh, asking for market rate off-road or garage parking for office buildings. So that's kind of uh, how we think about uh, our parking regulations uh, in the city of Boston. And uh, within this framework, uh, uh, you can ask me, well, what are Boston's regulations to implement these policies. And uh, we essentially have uh, two main instruments that we use, uh, I, could, I should say, finely developed instruments uh, that we use. Uh, one is the Boston Parking Freeze, and the other is a Transportation Access Plan Agreement, or a TAPA, that we sign with every developer. Uh, while the first looks at uh, reducing parking supply, the second gives us the ability to uh, institute parking ratios, mainly maximum parking ratios, and to institute a TDM program. So from a climate perspective, uh, that's where uh, the parking freeze comes in. And essentially, uh, the Boston, uh, we have three districts that are uh, parking freeze districts. <coughs> Fundamentally, what they do is they cap the number of parking spaces that are allowed in that district in perpetuity, essentially. And uh, there's one district in the downtown area. There's another uh, in the South Boston waterfront and residential area, including the Innovation District. And the third is in East Boston, which really uh, has to do with the airport. The downtown parking freeze limits, uh, but actually instituted back in uh, 1983 uh, through, through the EPA. So it's been around for decades. And it essentially has put a cap on the amount of parking spaces in downtown Boston, public parking spaces, I should say, to 35,000. The South Boston parking freeze, which has been around since the mid-90s, has uh, put a cap on all existing parking spaces, except if you're coming in with a new building, they allow one space per dwelling unit or, or home. And uh, there's a set aside to accommodate new development of about 3,000 spaces. And the last parking freeze uh, is in East Boston. It's actually uh, administered by Massport. And uh, it has to do with managing uh, parking in, in, in the airport area, for example. Fundamentally, these parking freeze have been extremely successful in keeping the supply of parking in Boston uh, extremely low. And it's not without reason that the cost of an off-street parking space in downtown Boston is second only to Manhattan, uh, if you look uh, around the country. So that was on the climate front. On the convenience front, we, have, we really use our access plan agreements, or TAPAs, as, I call, as we call them, uh, to find the right balance between uh, having enough parking to make it uh, convenient uh, so that you can get parking when you need it, but not having too much parking so that there's congestion or, uh, uh, or too much uh, traffic volume on our streets. Essentially, every developer who uh, has to uh, come in to do a development uh, pr proposal has to, through the Boston Zoning Code, uh, go through an Article 80 process. And 
as part of that zoning code, Article 80 process, they are required to sign this TAPA uh, with the city. And we use this TAPA essentially to, uh, again, uh, institute uh, the parking, uh, parking ratios, mainly maximum parking ratios for every new development that comes in, and to really uh, institute a very, very uh, progressive, if I can say that, uh, DDM program. And these TAPAs are done uh, hand in hand with our development staff uh, over at our uh, planning agency, the BRA. So they're done simultaneously. So while there's a design review going on for uh, the project review, uh, there is uh, there's a TAPA process that's being uh, that's being gone through as well. The parking ratios that have come about uh, through the TAPA process are. Uh, in the neighborhoods, it's down to uh, one parking space per dwelling unit. It's much lower in downtown. Uh, for office and commercial spaces, it's down to uh, 0.75 uh, per 1,000 square feet of development. And uh, if you go to, uh, I should again point out that the minimum parking requirements that, are, that abound in the city are superseded by, through the Article 80 process, so we do have a legal mechanism to keep uh, parking ratios uh, as maximums and uh, lower if possible. I won't go into the details of this chart, but essentially uh, these are the parking ratios that we use. These are all maximum parking ratios. As a practical matter, for the last 10 years, most development in Boston has come in at 0.75, whether it's for housing or whether it's for commercial space. Uh, of late, projects are coming in with no parking. There are six such projects in Boston, and uh, of course, we, we can debate whether, those, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, this is a policy that's had uh, huge, huge uh, uh, advantages uh, for the city. If, we, if the parking, uh, if the TAPAs allow us to look at parking ratios, they allow, also allow us to institute a very, very progressive uh, TDM program and uh, particularly on providing those different kinds of parking spaces to make it more convenient to make a, to make a more choice for residents and for office goers. Uh, for example, we uh, have very strict uh, bicycle parking ratio requirements, uh, one space per dwelling unit, uh, covered secure parking space, and uh, similarly there are other ratios for, as you go down, whether you're in an institution, if you're in a new college, uh, or whether you're a residential building or an office building. We also require uh, electric uh, and car share parking spaces. These are mandatory requirements, and developers uh, don't have a problem in providing these uh, because uh, this is what their tenants will want uh, down the years. And of course, we work with all the TMAs uh, to, to institute these uh, DDM programs, particularly on the management side. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing in terms of new programs uh, in, in Boston, and these really have to do with that third piece, uh, the third dimension, which, has, uh, which is cost. And uh, we have, uh, last, since last fall, installed uh, parking sensors uh, to have a smart parking pilot uh, in the Innovation District. These are, uh, we've uh, the Innovation District is uh, out in South Boston on the other side of the Fort Point Channel from downtown Boston. Uh, we've essentially installed uh, about 320, 350 odd uh, sensors uh, on the three major arterials in the Innovation District and the streets in between. And uh, what this has allowed us to do is working with Streetline is that today, if you drive into Boston, into the Innovation District, you can look at your smart, you can get an app and look at your smartphone to see where uh, spaces might be available. Uh, if you are a local business, you can install a widget on your, on your, uh, uh, on your website, on your local, on your own kind of business website, uh, and that will tell you where parking spaces are available. And most importantly for us, uh, we are getting reams of data uh, from, uh, from this, uh, uh, through this pilot. Uh, and we're finding uh, that uh, where we have, on the two major arterials where we have uh, a four-hour parking, uh, 
there is overutilization of those parking spaces and where we have uh, two hour parking, which is on Summer Street near the convention center, uh, that's underutilized. Uh, but we're, we'll, we'll continue to study uh, this pilot in the coming year, uh, years, two years, but we hope that uh, through surveys and through promoting uh, the availability of this app, uh, we can look at uh, a variable timing for our meters as well as uh, a variable pricing uh, if, if that's some a direction we want to go. Uh, this is my final slide. Uh, and we, we talked about this a lot in the past and the trend, just as it is for garage parking or off-street off parking, to provide more choices in the kinds of parking that's available. For curb parking or on-street parking, there are similar trends. And as uh, many of you uh, know, we've, uh, the city of Boston uh, had took out, or, took out uh, uh, several blocks of parking to accommodate uh, a bus lane on Essex Street for the Silver Line. And similarly, there are three roads, uh, including Mass Ave in the Back Bay, where we took out uh, parking, on-street parking, uh, to accommodate a bicycle lane. Uh, similarly, uh, we've <coughs> given up parking spaces uh, to get uh, bike share, the hubway, uh, stations located all over the city, uh, scooter and motorcycle parking. Uh, and of course, we're looking to uh, expand public space, uh, including the provision of parklets and uh, providing new plazas, much in the New York style uh, plazas uh, and uh, curb extensions. So uh, that was a very quick overview of, uh, of where Boston is going. And uh, we can talk about any of these topics for, for a long time. <laughs> but I'll leave it at that for, for, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Vineet. Our next and final speaker is Ted Brovitz. He is the manager of community planning and design at Howard Stein Hudson Associates and has over 25 years of experience in both the public and private sectors. As a consulting planner, he, focused on, he is focusing on sustainable community planning and design. He's spearheaded dozens of community master plans, downtown revitalization plans, economic, economic development and marketing strategies, corridor redevelopment plans and zoning bylaws and more. Um, prior to becoming a consultant, when he worked in the public sector, he was the director of planning and development for the town of Brattleboro, Vermont, the executive director of the Hyannis Main Street Business Improvement District, and executive director of Fitchburg by Design. He has a master's degree in environmental management from Duke University and earned his bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Rollins College. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Now, 25 years, I feel old now. <laughs> well, thanks for having me here. I, uh, I'm here to talk about minimums and maximums, but I also want to talk about uh, some, some steps that should be taken in every community uh, before you start uh, putting together new regulations or revising what you have in place. Um, how many people have a parking problem in your community? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it, but I'm sure back in your, you know, in, in, your, in front of your boards of selectmen, your planning boards, parking's a major issue. It's a major issue in every place I work in. Whether it's real or perceived, it's an issue. Uh, and it's typically hotly contested. So when we work with communities and put together new regulations, uh, we have to be really careful about how far we want to push the envelope. And we, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, really defining what the community wants to see in different parts of the town or the city, um, looking at your current parking system, how well it's working, uh, and then thinking about you know detailed standards in particular areas so that you get the most efficient use of parking spaces without gobbling up you know important a lot of land. So uh, with that, the first step in my mind is always to take a step backward and look at uh, your community and see what. Uh, you know, the, the differences in the land use patterns, the differences in terms of the community's vision for uh, different areas, whether you're talking about your village center, your downtown, or your traditional neighborhoods, or your suburban neighborhoods, or your rural areas, there are different characteristics and different uh, needs in, in every, every different part of your community. You know, for example, in your village center, your downtown, you're more reliant or you have an opportunity to have more public transit, more access by, on foot or by bike. Uh, more uh, shared parking between or resources in terms of uh, uh, public facilities and service lots. Uh, whereas when you get in the more rural areas, it's pretty much you know, a site-by-site -site basis. There's more reliance on the automobile. 
And these factors have to be considered when you're putting together uh, your standards. So uh, when you're looking at downtown, obviously the uh, important factor is the, the public parking uh, resource that's there. And it's not only there uh, to serve as an economic development tool, but it can be a traffic calming tool. Um, it can help you build a more walkable, attractive environment if it's well positioned and well distributed. Um, so these are just things that have to be considered. When you're talking about a commercial highway sort of application, and all of our communities around New England have over the last 50 years pretty much rezoned all of these major uh, roadways coming into town for our commercial purposes, and they have been transitioning in various ways and shapes and forms over the years, uh, you need to think about how how you want it to look over the next 10 or 15 years and what the parking standard should be to achieve those objectives. And a lot of times what we're working with is strip development that um, is isolated, individual properties are isolated, there's very high parking standards, much more than they typically would need, and there's no opportunity to uh, connect and share resources and the walking environment is just terrible. So if your idea is that you want to make it a more attractive, a more economically successful uh, 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 environment in, in corridor, um, then don't just think about you know the, the the development standards. Think about how the parking can contribute to that to that idea, to that vision. Uh, things like um, um, you know, on-street parking, if that's feasible, uh, shared parking, reducing the overall requirements, uh, side street access, shared access. All of these factors can have a major difference, can make a major difference in terms of how these corridors reinvent themselves or, or redevelop. So, you know, so it's, it's something that's often overlooked, but it's such an important part of the, the picture as far as uh, the community's vision for these, these strip development corridors. So I always think of, you know, parking, uh, uh, you know, regulations including, you know, basic uh, uh, provisions, um, you know, what are the goals and objectives? Again, in my mind, it's always maximizing the utilization and efficiency of land with the least number of parking spaces required. But uh, before you put together regulations, I, I really think it's really important to, to look at what you have in place. So, for example, you know, if you're looking at a downtown district, what is the, you know, what is the, 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 the split between public and parking and public and private uh, parking uh, facilities and, and spaces? How well is it distributed? How well is it utilized? Uh, what are the occupancy rates? What are the turnover rates? Uh, what are the factors as far as future development goes that could have an impact on uh, the parking needs down the road? So if you look at the upper example, the graphic there, that's downtown Norwood. Um, and the factors are different there than a lot of other downtowns. Um, they have uh, two uh, commuter, commuter train uh, stations at either end of downtown. Um, and there's a lot of people that can walk out of the neighborhoods above that into the downtown area. So the parking demands are less than they would be in a lot of other downtowns. So in that case, in looking at the, the turnover rates, the occupancy rates, on a block-by-block -block basis, we determined that about one space for 400 uh, square feet was appropriate there um, and started to revise the standards accordingly. The lower image is Stoughton, where you have a commuter rail station, but in a, in a good sort of distribution of public and private parking. But the issue there is that a lot of people don't know where the, where the parking is. And a lot of the lots are disjointed, not connected, so that you, can, you, you have uh, you know, individual small lots that ultimately could be uh, coordinated and redesigned so that you, you maximize the use of your spaces, uh, you get more out of it, and you have better access to, to parking. Um, looking at, uh, this, this is an image from uh, downtown Peabody. Again, they have good distribution of public and private parking, a good balance between on-street parking and off-street parking. Uh, the occupancy rates are very low, um, and again, there it's an issue of uh, not, not, not necessarily having, not having enough parking, uh, but finding the parking, knowing it's there, and also the shape and the condition of a lot of these lots. A lot of them are dark. Uh, they're kind of in, in areas that uh, you may be a little bit concerned about in terms of uh, being too far from any activity, and uh, they're making an effort now to re-examine those lots and try to uh, redesign them so that their people are more comfortable uh, using them, and uh, hopefully that will lead to uh, some more re revitalization of the community, the downtown area. And then, you know, finally, uh, 
it up finally, but uh, you know, what, how accessible is your, your area for as far as pedestrian and bicycle and transit? How should that factor into your overall parking standards? Uh, you know, if you have good uh, um, uh, bus service, if you have a lot of people that can walk from surrounding neighborhoods, um, if there's a lot of uh, uh, bicycle traffic, you maybe you have uh, local colleges, then that's an opportunity maybe to uh, factor that in and reduce the number of parking requirement, the standards that you need. And then uh, management, look at your management system. You know, are you getting the best, most efficient use of your public parking system? Um, are your, you have short-term and long-term parking so that your employees are parking further out and that the on-street spaces in the core area are turning over on a regular basis and are dedicated to customer uh, uh, parking. Also, permit parking. We find a lot of communities that don't have permits for residents or for long-term parkers uh, that could make a big difference as far as providing um, uh, or, or making your, your system more efficient. Um, and then, of course, there's enforcement. The, the dilemma about enforcement. Should we have meters? Should we not have meters? Um, do we want to drive customers away by giving them tickets? Uh, and it's sort of a, a difficult sort of catch-22 in that you want enforcement so that your, your short-term spaces in particular are turning over properly. Uh, and that also, if, you know, that, that will, uh, if, if there's meters involved or there's fund, you know, there's, if there's a cost of parking, that helps you make reinvestments in your parking system. Um, and that's all, you know, benefiting and contributing to, hopefully, a vibrant downtown area. So enforcement is important uh, to, you know, for turnover as well as uh, getting, uh, you know, people to reinvest in your downtowns. Um, and then once you, once you, you know, look at what the community's vision is, what the, what the, what the planning goals are, and then evaluate in, in, in this parking audit what the uh, conditions are in terms of public and parking effectiveness and efficiency, then you can start thinking about your standards and what you want to do as far as parking. And what we like to do is we like to break down the town zoning regulations into graphics so that we can clearly see what the uh, what the building envelopes are. So there's an, here's an example in a downtown setting where it's a pretty good uh, dimensional standards. You know, if you have minimum, uh, you know, no lot, minimum lot size, you have minimum front requirements, you have an envelope, a building envelope that brings the buildings closer to the street, and there's some specifics as far as where parking is placed on the lot, namely behind the buildings or to the side. Here's another example in a town we're working with up in Vermont, uh, and they have, it, it's all strip development, and they want to go and, and, and reinvent this, the, the, the corridor and, and create nodes for mixed use, higher density village centers. <laughs> Um, and what they're looking at is these standards that basically isolate every building on every individual lot. There's no opportunity for shared parking. There's, you know, wide frontages, uh, wide setbacks. And the bigger the building is, the bigger the lot has to be, and the more isolated it is from its neighboring properties. So um, they've, you know, through this process of going, of doing development scenarios, uh, they've determined for themselves that that doesn't work. What we're willing to do is to rethink these standards so that we create the opportunity for five minutes left while I'm way behind. <laughs> we create the opportunity for uh, you know denser, higher, uh, you know, a denser mixed-use development. So let me go through these quickly. The, the, the key to this is, and I know how difficult it is to get changes made to your parking standards, and I always uh, I'm not so worried about the minimum and the maximum. I know some towns have it all figured out. That, you know, they've got a uh, minimum parking standard for ice cream parlors. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, it, it really depends, again, on, on the particular characteristics of different parts of your community. But if you have a standard in place and it's a reasonable standard, I always, I always suggest that, you know, give people the opportunity to offset that with uh, parking reduction methods. So, for example, if you're in a downtown setting and you've got five spaces, public on-street parking spaces, in front of your building, your business, let them deduct that from their on-site requirements. If there's a uh, off-street public parking lot within X number of reasonable walking distance, that should be de deducted from on-site parking requirements. And there's so many different uh, tools in the toolbox that you can use to ultimately, given the particular characteristics of an area, uh, reduce parking to almost nothing if, you know, in, in fact, it could be nothing if you have the right set of circumstances and resources in a particular district. So, you know, shared parking, uh, if you look at the images to the right, 
Um, the, the one on top is from the smart code. It's a real simple sort of uh, determination of uh, how much parking you need with mixed uses. Uh, the one on the bottom is ULI shared parking manual. And that's a much more detailed evaluation of, of the site uh, uh, mix of uses and what the, what the parking needs are. Um, but having the opportunity to share parking and reduce parking through uh, shared uh, 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 use is really, really important. Of course, there's remote and satellite parking. Um, again, having the opportunity to discount the on-site requirements through, uh, you know, for, mostly for employees, if they can walk a reasonable distance. Uh, valet and tandem parking is, is something you see more and more in, uh, in, uh, in uh, parking standards. Uh, proximity to bus and rail, uh, car sharing, uh, pedestrian access, and of course transportation demand management are all factors in reducing the parking requirements. So let's look at a couple examples. Here's the village of West Concord. Um, and the center of the village, uh, there are a series of property owners that for years have been fighting over uh, their individual parking, parking lots and trying to keep people out of their, you know, their spaces and that sort of thing. Well, they finally got together and reorganized a lot, got a lot more parking out of it, provided you know, joint access, and it works perfectly. You know, it's a perfect example of shared parking and a, and a cooperative effort between uh, property owners that have a lot in common, have a lot to lose if they don't uh, think about how they're going to manage the parking system. Um, there's also the opportunities to offset your, re your parking requirements if you are near uh, on-street spaces or uh, public off-street spaces. Uh, the town has an agreement with the MBTA uh, to have parking uh, for residents uh, at the commuter train station for residents, as well as to allocate uh, parking, uh, a certain number of, number of parking spaces to support the village as a whole. Here's downtown Hyannis. This is the uh, a good sized parking lot off of um, North Street uh, on the north side of the uh, of Main Street. Um, it's uh, a combination of different uh, individual uh, property owners as well as the town owns uh, several of the pieces in there. And they've reorganized it as one large lot and they've maximized the, uh, uh, the efficiency and the use of, of this lot. Um, it's not the prettiest lot, but it, it, uh, it, it provides you know, a very convenient uh, large uh, parking <coughs> resource for people coming in uh, from out of town. Uh, the next one is in uh, downtown Wellesley or Wellesley Center. Uh, here you have parking standards that are fairly high still. However, you're allowed to um, uh, uh, offset your on-site uh, your, your on parking requirements by uh, being within a certain distance of the public parking lot uh, that you see in the lower image on the right. Uh, other towns have, uh, have parking in lieu of, uh, you contribute to uh, a public parking fund, and that's for the purposes of building larger uh, facilities, in this case, uh, parking garages, the one you have in Northampton. Uh, there's no parking requirements in downtown, but you have to contribute to uh, this parking fund, which helps support the downtown economic development initiatives. Same with Brattleboro, um, and uh, even in a smaller setting in Plymouth, you have, a, you have the opportunity to uh, contribute to a public parking fund in lieu of having on-site parking spaces. We talked a little bit about uh, stacked parking and tandem parking. Uh, this comes from Northampton. Uh, this is a, a common thing in their downtown area, particularly with restaurants. And then placement standards. I know I'm running out of time. I always have too much time. Um, landscaping. Um, you know, rather than having a lot of you know complicated uh, design standards, um, really I think it's about having you know uh, trees in the parking lot, shade trees, providing good pedestrian access. Um, having buffers where you need them, where there's uh, potentially um, uh, conf conflicts between uh, adjacent uses, residential and commercial, uh, but making it fairly simple and straightforward is the best approach. Again, having access to the public. It's amazing how, to me how many towns don't have any kind of internal circulation requirements for pedestrians or uh, connections between the, the, the buildings and the parking lots and the public parking system. Uh, and even towns that uh, have public parking facilities and their villages in, in, in downtowns, they don't have uh, good access between those and the main, the main street, the main corridors. Um, so that's really something that's important. Obviously, bike standards. Um, I'm always amazed that uh, there's, there's so many towns that still don't have any bike standards. If you go to uh, Burlington, Vermont, it's very significant uh, standards. All, but you know that's a college town, so there's a lot of people on bikes. Um, I was in Worcester. Uh, 
at the courthouse a couple of days ago, and they have two bike racks for this beehive of activity. It's just amazing. One of them actually got flattened by a car that jumped the curb and, and knocked it over. So uh, it, it, uh, it's something that it, it, it needs to find its way into these standards. Uh, uh, sustainable design standards, you're seeing a lot of uh, parking being reused or, or uh, coupled with uh, energy production, or wind turbines, solar panels. Uh, the, the image in the, in the lower center is from Wellesley. It's the uh, it's a supermarket that's got uh, stands uh, stations for uh, electric cars. Even reverse angle uh, parking is becoming uh, more prominent in New England, uh, where you're backing into spaces, uh, parallel spaces, rather than pulling in uh, nose first. Uh, common in other parts of the country, but not so much here. Um, and then reusing or using your parking spaces as gathering. And I think uh, some of you probably saw uh, Professor Ben Joseph's uh, presentation this morning about rethinking a lot, his, his book, and it's great stuff. And, uh, you know, these are, these, are, uh, these are spaces that are used um, on a regular basis, but when there's an opportunity, you know, adding farmer's markets to them or craft shows or uh, basically any kind of civic gathering, vendor's courts, uh, food courts, that sort of thing is is really a, 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 something to contribute to the overall vitality of a, of a given district. Okay, so I'm told I'm out of time. Of course, I have way too many slides. Uh, but again, I just want to emphasize how important the placement of parking is in building context and character. And uh, this is a slide that shows um, shared parking resources, internal connections, shared access. All these things are important when you're trying to uh, achieve uh, a vision for a particular district, whether it's a commercial corridor or uh, a downtown or a neighborhood. Uh, the placement of parking and its connectivity to surrounding areas is really critical. Here's an example of a form-based code, which really emphasizes, you know, the positioning of buildings and, and uh, parking spaces um, and, and you get a predictable outcome as far as uh, the, the, the type of the development you're going to get in different districts. You may have heard the uh, term uh, uh, sprawl uh, retrofit or commercial or uh, 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 sprawl repair. Uh, uh, this is uh, some images from the sprawl repair manual, again, showing the opportunity when you have excess parking to reuse some of that space for infill development, uh, expansion of existing buildings, uh, basically creating some enclosure to the street and improving the, walk, the, the walking environment, the pedestrian environment. So what do you do when you have a strip like this? We have wide open curb cuts, no streetscape, um, you know, no, no um, uh, conditions as far as, you know, getting parking in and out uh, safely. Um, you can start with this, having some more specific placement standards um, and more attractive uh, uh, building standards, uh, you know, sort of parking on the side, rear access, adjoining uh, connections. Um, or you go further. This is, uh, this is Wellesley's plan for Linden Street 10 years ago. And today, they're doing a lot of infill development using excess parking, which is a real benefit from a tax point of view, but also you know, creating a real, a real uh, asset for the community. Here's some infill development along the street. And not only uh, private development, but they actually put parking back on the street, uh, public parking back on the street. Um, and they've got some really great street scrape treatments, and it's really become a, a blossoming district in a, more of a traditional neighborhood. Uh, talk a little bit about form-based code. Here's a form-based code from Amherst, which unfortunately hasn't been adopted, but the same thing, you know, adding parking to the street. In this case, it's not public parking. They have a narrow right-of-way. So what we're allowing is parking to happen on the edge of the right-of-way, which functions like on-street parking, uh, but is really a, a private development. And finally, uh, Malta, New York. Uh, this is a blossoming village center, and they just adopted a form-based code, and they've got a long way to go because uh, the corridor is a major highway and uh, the jurisdiction is this, this, it's actually the same street as downtown Saratoga Springs, uh, but the state has jurisdiction and is very reluctant uh, to let any traffic calming occur. But their code has allowed on-street parking off the edge of the right-of-way. So if, again, it's, you know, it's privately owned, but it functions like public on-street parking. Unfortunately, uh, DOT came in, and you see the lower uh, image on the right, and they put bollards up, so you can't use it at this point. So hopefully someday in the future um, that'll happen. They'll, they'll allow them to do some more streetscape treatments to ca calm traffic and essentially create the village center that, that the community envisions. Uh, so I know I've gone way over my time limit, but uh, 
I want to thank you and turn it back over to Michelle. I want to thank our three panelists, and now is your opportunity to ask questions. We do have a microphone. Eric's going to bring the microphone around. There's a lady right here. Two quick questions. One is, are your slides available anywhere online, or is there some way you could make them available to us to peruse at our leisure? Me, everybody? Yeah, my well, everybody but yours sure. in particular. Great. So they'll Thank be up you. on the web at the MAPC website. Great. Thank you. Um, my other question is, um, our problem is existing businesses in particular, some new development in our small suburban town. Um, how do we get them to play nice with each other? We talk about shared drives and shared parking. And, you know, our one example of that almost happening was a shared drive that one owner then blocked off his portion when the Starbucks decided to go into the other strip center next door. Um, how do we, how do we spur that to happen? Is, are there regs, you know, the, the private property land rights are kind of so solid that I, I don't see ways that we can spur that to happen. We just have to kind of wait for the goodwill <laughs> of the owners, and that's not happening in our town. Well, I, I know for, in my experience, for, in, in Shelburne, Vermont, we're doing a, a corridor study and a, a concept plan, a redevelopment plan, and then coupling that with regulations, form-based code, and they've got very steep standards. They have one space per uh, 200 gross square feet uh, in a commercial, uh, in, a, in a strip area in a rural town, and it's completely unnecessary. There's so many large lots out there that are completely underutilized. Um, and so we're not so much concerned about changing that minimum requirement. We're concerned with providing better opportunities to do infill development, you know, higher lot coverages, higher density, uh, mixed use, because that's what they want in particular in, in certain areas of the corridor. So if you give developers or, or property owners, adjacent property owners, an opportunity to add more development to their lot, second and third buildings, expansions of existing buildings, adding mixed use, um, in exchange for um, sharing lots, you know, connecting with adjacent lots, connecting with neighborhoods behind them, if you can get the neighbors to agree to that, um, sharing access, you know, create, create the incentives through basically higher density and mixed use, which, which a lot of them are interested in doing. Um, that's not the case in every community, uh, but if you keep the standards where they are and you provide incentives for, you know, that type of opportunity with those conditions, Quality, good quality design, good you know, sharing resources, then hopefully you can get them to buy in. I know it's difficult in downtowns because in every downtown I go to, there's a parking problem, serious parking problem. And, you know, we all have towns, you know, downtowns with owners that complain a lot about it but park right in front of their businesses. Um, so um, that's a difficult, much more difficult question. There it's more, more an issue of management, having customers be able to find the spaces, and making sure that the, the, the better spaces or the, the more core area spaces are getting better proper turnover. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for incentives and, and make, matching the incentives with the community's vision. I just want to follow up on that a little bit. Um, I, I think I see what you're saying. You know, four property owners that each can park eight spaces with the right agreement can restripe and reformat and, and make it for 60 spaces. Is there draft language, draft agreements that small towns can look at to approach them with? Because, you know, just our word for it isn't going to help. They need to see something in writing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've got some examples. I can share those with you. There, there are lots of examples of shared parking agreements and and uh, legal agreements and, that, and such. So, um, if you give me your card afterwards. I can I can send you some stuff. Yep. Uh, is this this is working? Okay, so. Uh, I looked at the name of this session, and uh, because I work in planning and zoning, I thought about uh, minimum and maximum off-street parking ratios that are in the zoning code, because that's what I deal with most of the time. And uh, by way of example, for minimum off-street parking ratios, uh, it just seems so obvious to me sitting in these sessions today 
that our uh, minimums are too high and that we often don't have maximums where they should be. And in my practice, I see this in Boston neighborhoods and I hear it from uh, stakeholders in the neighborhoods where I work. Uh, this all seems so obvious that we need to reduce uh, government mandated off street parking, but presumably at some time in the past, uh, folks like us all thought that we needed to have these minimums. And I apologize if I'm the only one that uh, is thinking along these lines, but I'm curious, maybe on the historic perspective, how we got to having the regulations we have in the first place, if it's so obvious that they're wrong, and uh, have we disproven uh, the presumed need for these regulations uh, that, that were in people's minds when they were first put in place? Thank you. I'm convinced that many of those regulations came from typical developments in Kansas and Nebraska. <laughs> They were not predicated in development in urban America like the communities we, we represent that have such small available land areas available to such projects. I can also tell you that uh, uh, very often when you are working with an applicant, say a Home Depot or, or uh, an entity like that, they're constantly looking for more parking than what your requirements predicate. And uh, as you work with them over time, you find out why. Much of that has to do with the fact that their garden centers end up being located within that parking lot after the fact. So, it, you know, a, a lot of it has to do with context and urban requirements tend to be in my experience, much less because there are more people walking and there are more people, in my opinion, making shorter trips out of that than would be the case in a more suburban location. Uh, one comment to add to that. Uh, uh, first, I agree that it's uh, probably a planning manual that was put together uh, by somebody back in the 50s that got the minimums. but. Uh, equally important, I think, that it reflects the times. So I think that most of the sparking ratios were put in when uh, people were looking to attract more development and felt that they needed parking to make that development successful. Uh, it's quite the opposite now. Uh, people, uh, developers are coming in with, uh, with little parking and are convinced that their building is going to work. So we now have maximums rather than minimums. I, I think all the standards came from New Jersey, myself. I think it's part of the original, you know, exodus from New York City and the suburban development in and around the metropolitan area. I mean, this, I mean, frankly, you know, these standards were, you know, 50 years old, and they evolved out of an era where, you know, you try to get, you know, uh, you know, people into their cars and into the suburbs and, you know, building major transportation systems and, and out of, you know, older cities. And, and they've just, you know, they just sort of hung on for so many years and generations. If people are starting to, you know, question them, really, you know, are they really necessary? Do we need all that parking? Or, or can we rethink, you know, how we use our, our space, especially in New England where we don't have a lot of space like they do in the South and the West. Um, and, and, and cities and towns, you know, they, they, they get hung up on parking, but they need to think about, you know, how do we use, how do we best use our, our land resource? And if we can utilize, reutilize some of that, that parking, if we don't need it, and we can prove that we don't need it, uh, for other uses that contributes to our affordable housing needs or our you know, commercial tax base, then you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. And same with the developer and the owners of those properties. So I, I think there they're, they're, they're old standards that were uh, a different area when uh, you know, everyone was uh, leaving the cities and everyone was in their cars. and, and, and and going from, you know, to their house, to their job, to the shopping, and, 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 that's, and that's changed. People are going back to cities and older neighborhoods, and uh, we need to get with the times. Thank you. A uh, question for Mr. Gupta. As part of your presentation, you put up a slide of the back bay showing what the cost of parking was under uh, various ownership scenarios, including residential, which was labeled as free for a resident permit. Question is, in the city of Boston, 
how many residential permits have you issued versus the number of residential parking spaces available? And second, given the tone of the conversation all day today, why aren't you charging for residential permits? Uh, I, I knew somebody would ask these two questions, so thank you for, <laughs> so thank you for asking them uh, both together. So uh, we are uh, for a neighborhood like the Back Bay or a neighborhood like uh, the Beacon Hill uh, and the North End, I think those three neighborhoods uh, we are probably, I, I don't have the exact number because we don't know, but we haven't done the exercise of finding out how many, uh, precisely how many on-street parking spaces there are. And uh, I would think that there are about two times or two and a half times the number of, uh, of, of approximately. <coughs> uh, and I, I think it's something that we should all talk about, uh, what that means. And uh, I should mention in that context that, and uh, Stephanie Pollock, uh, uh, talked about this in her presentation is that uh, let's take a village, uh, let's take a neighborhood like Bay Village where there's a new development that's coming with no new parking and it's got uh, about 150 uh, units and so the, the question is where are the folks who are moving in going to park and so the neighborhood says well they're going to park on our streets so the city of Boston has, will deny uh, yeah, but the, you know, will deny anybody who lives on that address a resident sticker. The other solution to that is that you ask that developer to have an arrangement with a nearby garage, which is what we did in this particular case. So, so the whole issue of uh, number of spaces and the number of resident stickers, it, it, it gets more complicated when you actually start implementing it. Uh, the second question has to do with uh, uh, why are they free? And uh, I think that if you if, if you look at what some of the other surrounding communities are charging, you know, $30 a year, uh, that's practically free as well. And uh, to the extent that a fees might cover the administrative cost of having the program, it, it probably makes sense. Uh, but for if you're in a resident parking district, uh, you know, it, it's a discussion to have with the neighborhood. It's not something that we would do uh, offhand. Hi, uh, Melissa Woods, uh, City of Somerville. And I had a question for you as well. Um, we, on the day-to-day, -day, I do development review. So many times um, I go out into neighborhoods and they're upset about um, even a complying parking, um, parking plan um, and have offered up the suggestion to not offer resident permits to these addresses. Um, how long has Boston limited uh, issuing permits to particular developments and is that I could see that situation backfiring in someone signing in a lease not knowing that that's not a possibility um, so what has the outcome been um, in the time that this has been allowed right and it's it's not something that that we do every day you know the, there maybe there are a handful a half a dozen cases where, where this is true but essentially uh, through that access plan agreement the TAPA that I talked about we require the developer to mention uh, in their lease so that if I'm signing in, I'm, if I'm leasing uh, a rental unit, uh, I, I will come across uh, language, but many developers are refusing to do that. And their lawyers are saying that's not going to work. And so in those cases, we are asking them to at least have a letter that's given to uh, tenants or future tenants that uh, guess what, if, if you live here on this address, the chances are you won't be given a uh, uh, resident permit sticker. Uh, you know, somebody can kind of contest that, and I don't know what will happen, uh, but uh, that's kind of the, it's not like a written policy somewhere, it's just something that we practice. We have time for one or two more questions, so. Hi, um, we've, the subject of shared parking has come up many times and it's something that makes a lot of sense but we've had a lot of trouble getting traction on that because the owners always say that they're concerned about liability and uh, somebody said to me yesterday well what if somebody comes in here at night and falls and cracks their head am I gonna be sued 
Is that a real issue? Have you come upon that? Is there a way around it? One of the things that we're going to be pursuing as part of a shared parking approach is to actually have town council draw up some draft agreements that provide a limitation of liability uh, to which a property owner who's made a lease with a, a leasee uh, has the ability to protect themselves and the person who's parking in that lot has signed an agreement that they're liable as they would be effectively in in their own parking lot or their own driveway that's exactly right rather and that is effectively a contractual agreement but uh, I think that council is working his way through the language of that. That's one of the things that I want to present to property owners that gives them the incentive to make some money, number one, but to protect themselves, number two, and help their neighbor at the same time. Uh, without question, it's one of those things that to me uh, is a bigger... 800 pound elephant than what it really is <laughs> the gentleman in the blue shirt over here has had his hand up for a long time so we're going to end with your question <laughs> really for uh, mr uh, the gentleman from natic i'm sorry um can you describe the process of i guess educating your town and the officials in the town, but also the townsfolk and, and council and things like that as to not only the need, but how we go about reducing parking, just how that, how that worked. Sure. It, one of the great things about town government, and particularly in Natick, is the fact that it's so committee-oriented. And a public committee gets an idea. They begin to flesh that out. That committee then provides its recommendations up the food chain ultimately to the board of selectmen and then finally to town meeting so at each of those levels it gains support it's a, a full vetting process uh, you do the complete cuss and discuss level of wrestling with the individual items as part of the full breadth of what this new policy might mean so it, through each of those phases you gain a level of support with that committee and group that then helps at the next stage and the next i will candidly tell you that uh, having a really astute planning board is priceless because they are salespeople extraordinaire and when they also happen to be town meeting members who can speak from the floor, it's priceless. What a great way to end. Okay. Thank you all for being here today. Thank our panelists again. <laughs>